Hello, everyone. My name is Elaine Willette. I am the Northeast School Nurse Regional Liaison for the Maine Department of Education. And our presentation today will be Assessment of the Ear for School Nurses. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to cover ear anatomy, basic functions of the ear, using an otoscope, and ear pathology. So as you all know, the human ear has three main parts, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The middle ear has three bones that you're going to need to be aware of, the malleus, the stapes, and the incus. In your early school nursing days, you may remember this as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So our focus today is on the middle ear and the eardrum. The middle ear is an ear air-filled space that is sealed behind the tympanic membrane. It's connected to the back of the throat through the eustachian tube. This eustachian tube allows for changes in pressure in the middle ear. So the middle ear pressure is supposed to be the same as the outer ear pressure. When that pressure increases or decreases, it can cause pain and pain is not good. So when that eustachian tube becomes inflamed or infected by some kind of a secretion or blocked, the person often um, can't regulate the pressure in the middle ear. You see in the first picture how narrow that eustachian tube is in the infant compared to the one of the adult. It's almost parallel to the ground, and the one of the adults is at a 45 degree angle. As you can imagine, the smaller the child, the smaller the eustachian tube, the more difficult it is for the fluid to drain from the middle ear when that eustachian tube becomes inflamed. So how does fluid get into that middle ear? Well, it starts with an infection some type of infection, either bacteria or a virus or both. When there's an invader or an infection of your sinuses or when you have a cold, your nose produces mucus and a watery like discharge to flush out that pathogen. The same thing happens in the middle ear. When there's an invader, it will produce fluid to try to wash away those pathogens. The germs are supposed to get washed out through that eustachian tube down the back of the throat or nose. If that eustachian tube is swollen or not working properly, it can't drain and the fluid gets stuck in that middle ear space. Sometimes that fluid can remain there after the infection is gone. The longer the fluid remains there, the thicker it becomes. Fluid in the middle ear that's been there for about a week is very thin and causes minimal problems. Sometimes a little bit of muffled hearing, but that's about it. If the fluid remains there for two to four weeks, it tends to become thicker. And what was now a mild hearing loss can become a moderate hearing loss. And fluid that remains there for longer periods of time become very thick. This thick fluid is sometimes the consistency of glue and is very thick, so it can't drain out that eustachian tube that is already swollen. Those three bones in the middle ear were designed to be in an air-filled space. When fluid fills that space, the bones can't vibrate properly, causing some hearing loss. In very young children, it could affect their development. Speech delays, it could affect behavior because they can't hear, and it could affect their balance. So younger children may not walk on time like they're supposed to. So how do you treat fluid in the middle ear? There's a procedure called a tympanostomy. 
which is insertion of ear tubes. So when fluid doesn't drain on its own, something has to be done if hearing is affected and if it lasts for a long time. Fluid in the middle ear can be called middle ear effusion, otitis media with effusion, serous otitis media, or glue ear. When you look through the otoscope, you're looking at the tympanic membrane for normal landmarks. The normal tympanic membrane is a light gray in color or a pearly white. In a normal healthy ear, the ear canal appears the same color as the person's skin, but the eardrum is usually still light gray or pearly white. If you look at the picture at 12 o'clock or at 11 o'clock, you can see the malleus bone. At 12 o'clock, you can see the incus bone. And if you look really carefully over here, you can see part of the stapes bone. Stapes bone is really difficult to visualize behind an eardrum, but if you look carefully, you can often see it. You're also going to look for the cone of light. It's usually triangular shaped. And this light is a reflection of the light from your otoscope onto the eardrum. So if there's fluid behind the eardrum and the eardrum is concave, the light reflex may look a little bit bent or different. Same thing if it's convex, if the eardrum is being sucked in from in decreased pressure in the middle ear, the cone of light may also look different. That cone of light um, extends anteriorly towards the face. So I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pencil. We're going to do some interactive components to this presentation. And the first one is, is this a right eardrum or a left eardrum? Remember I said the cone of light extends anteriorly towards the face. What do you think? Right or left eardrum? All right, it is a left eardrum because as you're looking through the otoscope, that cone of light extends towards the face. The picture of the right eardrum will have a cone of light somewhere between four and five o'clock. And the left eardrum, the cone of light is positioned usually in the seven or eight o'clock direction. So your ear exam begins with an inspection of the outer ear. You're looking for redness. You're looking for scars in front of or behind the ear from any previous surgeries. You're looking for bruising around the ear, especially after a traumatic injury. Bruising around the ear after a trauma could indicate a basal skull fracture, and you don't want to miss that. You're looking for redness behind the ear that could be an infection of the mastoid bone. As you can see in the lower picture, it's red behind the ear. And sometimes it's not a huge red, sometimes it's very subtle. So you have to look carefully. Mastoiditis is the most common complication of otitis media. You also want to push on the tragus and you want to pull gently on the ear to see if there's any pain. Once your outer ear inspection is done, you take your otoscope and you start the exam. You're going to use the tip that is the largest that fits the most comfortably in the ear. So you want the opening at the end to be the biggest it can be, but still be comfortable in the ear. You don't want one that's bigger than the ear canal. You also wanna make sure your battery is completely charged because a low battery causes low light. And when the light is low, it can produce a yellow tint on the eardrum, which you could misinterpret as ear fluid. So look at the four pictures. This is the second interactive piece, which picture shows the best technique for examining the ear. 
you can examine the ear in all four positions. One is best practice. Which one looks like it's best practice to you? The answer is number four. The reason for that is Look at his hand, it's touching the face of the child. The pinky and the ring finger are putting pressure on the child's face so that if that child moves their head, the otoscope moves with the person. So if that finger is not anchored to the cheek and the person moves their head, it could damage the outer ear canal. And children are curious, they're going to look to see what you're doing and they're wiggly, especially the younger ones. So it's important that you anchor your otoscope so that it moves with them when you're doing the exam. So your examination requires two hands. You're gonna turn the light on, gently insert the tip of the scope into the ear canal. You want to insert it barely into the canal and you want to rest it on that tragus. You don't want to shove it in all the way. You just want to put it in there gently. You're going to hold the otoscope like a pencil. You're going to use three fingers, the thumb, the index, and the middle finger. And you grasp the handle towards the end. You don't want to grasp it at the end because then it becomes very difficult to maneuver. Holding it close to the end will make it more stable and easier for you to move around in the ear canal. You wanna make sure that your pinky finger is sticking out so that it can rest against the side of the face. To examine the right ear, you hold the otoscope in the right hand and use the left hand to hold the ear. To examine the left ear, you change your otoscope to the left hand and use the right hand to hold the ear. You don't want to use the same hand to hold both ears because then you can't um, anchor the otoscope. You need to remember that that ear canal is not straight. So for a small child, you may need to pull the ear straight back or downward, while the ear of the older child or adult needs to be pulled back and upward. In order to get the best view of your ear canal, you're gonna to have to move both the outer ear and the otoscope up and down, back and forth, to be able to get the best position so that you can actually see the whole eardrum. When you're examining the ears, you always wanna check the one that doesn't hurt first so that you can compare it to the other one. When you start to look in the ear canal, you're first going to see the outer ear canal. Infection of the outer ear canal is called ex otitis externa or swimmer's ear. Typically, this is a bacterial infection. 10% of the time it can be fungal, but most of what you're going to see is bacterial you're going to see redness and swelling of the ear canal, and sometimes you're going to see drainage. There's usually pain with movement of the outer ear, and there are usually no changes in hearing. The pathogens that typically cause swimmer's ear are either Pseudomonas aeruginosa or Staphylococcus aureus. So they do need to be treated. So this is a medical referral. The other thing that's very common when you're examining the ear is earwax. You're going to see some cerumen in the ear canal. Cerumen can appear different colors. The longer it's been there, the darker it becomes. In children, it's typically this yellow honey colored. If you can get around it, sometimes you can move your otoscope around the wax so that you can still see the eardrum. 
sometimes if there's too much wax and it's obstructing the canal, you won't be able to see the eardrum. And this is a referral to the medical provider to have those ears cleaned and that wax removed. Sometimes in children, you're going to see black flies in their ear. If the black fly is alive, you can shine a light and it will go toward the light and usually come out on its own. So that's an interesting tidbit that you can try as a school nurse to take out a live black fly in the ear. So what's the difference between an ear infection and fluid behind the eardrum? Fluid behind the eardrum is called otitis media with effusion and is defined as the accumulated fluid in the middle ear space without evidence of inflammation or infection. So fluid by itself is not an infection. Fluid will also be present with an infection, but by itself, it usually goes away on its own. The most common presenting symptoms are ear fullness and hearing loss. So when you're doing an ear exam and the student fails their hearing test, you always want to take a peek in their ears to see what's going on. Ask them if they have a cold. Oftentimes they will have fluid behind the drum. You can recheck their hearing in about a few weeks or a month and hopefully it has improved by then. When you examine the eardrum with an otoscope, if there's fluid behind the ear, it often looks opaque and cloudy instead of translucent. You may see bubbles behind the eardrum and there may be a slight loss of that light reflex. So let's look at these three pictures. The first one, you can see the center has some kind of yellow colored circular, looks like pus behind the eardrum. This thick amber colored fluid is definitely fluid that's been there for a long time. And you can see how thick it is. This is probably a glue ear. The middle picture, you can see the bubbles behind the eardrum. The arrows point to three of them. If you look up around one o'clock or two o'clock, there's also a few more. How do ear bubbles get there? Well, the eustachian tube tries to equalize the pressure in the middle ear, and it always is not successful. So air gets into the ear behind the eardrum and it stays there, trapped in the fluid that can't drain. The third picture is an air fluid level. And you can see the line across the eardrum. There shouldn't be a line across the eardrum. When you see this, usually below the line is fluid and above the line is your normal airspace. And I've seen this quite a few times in my 25 years of school nursing. The ear fluid in this picture is pretty clear. So you know that it hasn't been there very long. This is a watch and wait situation. Monitor symptoms and follow it up. Hopefully it will improve in a couple of weeks. Sometimes it does take longer for fluid in the middle ear to go away. But oftentimes it's a watch and wait situation. So we've talked about glue ear. We've talked about fluid is in the middle ear, but it's not infected. Typically it either precedes or it follows an ear infection. Antibiotics will not help fluid go away behind the eardrum. Antibiotics are only for infection and many ear infections are not even bacterial infections, they're viruses. And antibiotics, they won't do anything for viruses. So oftentimes the physician will watch and wait. Typically in two or three days, the symptoms will improve and the child will get better without any medication. 
if the ear pain keeps getting worse and worse, or they develop a high fever that doesn't go away, then the physician may prescribe antibiotic at that time. So what does an ear infection look like? An acute otitis media is associated with bulging, opaqueness of the eardrum, and erythema. The eardrum is red and inflamed. The tissue will be pink or red, and there usually is fluid behind the eardrum. There's pain, sometimes fever, sometimes discharge. Like I said earlier, it often resolves on its own, Tylenol for the pain until they can, uh, the body can heal it by itself. There's one other thing I wanted to let you know, sometimes in a very young child, some of you have daycares or um, very young children in your schools, if they're crying or have been crying, that eardrum may appear to be red. A red eardrum is not always an infection. If the eardrum is pinkish or light red after the person, the baby has been crying, that happens. That's not an infection. And it looks different because in an infection, the redness will be sporadic and not the eardrum will not be bulging. The eardrum will be bulging in an infection, but will not be bulging if the baby has been crying. Excuse me. So now we're going to do the interactive portion. I want you to write down on your piece of paper what you see. Describe this eardrum. Also describe what you don't see. And what you think this is. What would your assessment be and how would you handle a student's eardrum? How would you handle the situation if you saw an eardrum that looked like this? So some of the things you could have written down, the eardrum is red, it's definitely bulging, it's opaque, you can't see through it. You can't visualize those bones. Your landmarks are not there. And that light reflex is deflected. It's not where you expect it to be. So this is definitely an acute otitis media. And all otitis media should be referred to the medical provider for evaluation. Number two. What do you see? Do you see your bony landmarks? What does the eardrum look like? Definitely looks abnormal. Yes, this is a perforated eardrum. You can see the big hole. One nurse was saying at my last presentation that she saw this on the eardrum, but had never seen a perforation before and thought it was a scratched eardrum. Luckily she referred and the physician's diagnosis came back as perforation. So they did watch and treat that student. If you look in the hole, you see a little light. That is probably the reflection on the eustachian tube. So you can actually partially see the eustachian tube through the hole, which is quite interesting. What do you see in this slide? What does the eardrum look like? Do you see your bony landmarks? Your cone of light? Is the eardrum red or bulging? 
What do you think? So you know the drum is translucent because you can see through it. It's not red. Your bones are visible in the middle ear. Your cone of light is visible at seven o'clock. So is this a right ear drum or a left ear drum? It's a left because the cone of light is between seven and eight o'clock position. If it was a right eardrum, it would be between four and five o'clock. And this is a normal eardrum. It might have a little bit of fluid in there, but it's not red, it's not bulging. So this, you would not be concerned. This is a normal eardrum. Here's an easy one. What do you see? Yes, this is an ear tube. Sometimes the doctors will perform a myringotomy, which is a slit in the eardrum to try to drain that fluid. After that slit, they usually put in an ear tube because if they just slit the ear and let the fluid out, the eardrum heals quite rapidly and the fluid may reaccumulate again. So putting a tube in helps to drain the fluid and equalize the pressure. It takes the pain away and it gives the body time to heal. And hopefully that eustachian tube inflammation will go away and will not come back. Okay, let me see if I can change the slide there. What do you see on this slide? What do you think? Is there redness? Do you see any landmarks? Is there bulging? Is there inflammation? What do you think? Well, this was a little bit of a trick question because this is not an eardrum. You can't see an eardrum. You can't see any markings. This is an abrasion in the ear canal from some type of a trauma, maybe a pencil in the ear. And you can also see that this is skin around the outside. It's not an eardrum. This would be much easier to tell if you were doing the exam that this was not an eardrum. Let's go to the next slide. This is a case study. So the 17 year old student has returned from Hawaii complaining of right ear discomfort. While she was on vacation, she had viral symptoms, including a sore throat, mild fever, cough and fatigue. She then developed right ear pain and was seen at an urgent care on the island and was diagnosed with an infection, along with an ear perforation and placed on oral antibiotics. She's on day seven of the 10 days of antibiotics and she comes to see you to have her ears checked. What do you see? What does the drum look like? Do you see the bony prominences? Do you see a cone of light? Do you see fluid? What would you do? And what would you tell the student? So the eardrum is opaque. You can't really see through it too much. You do see the malleus. You do see some air bubbles if you look.
closely right over over here there's some air fluid there's a red spot in the center that red spot in the center is a healing perforation and you can see it's almost closed up and it looks pretty good the cone of light is present there's some effusion here so there's still fluid behind the drum do you refer this or do you watch and wait? Because the students on day seven out of 10, I would watch and wait. This is definitely a healing infection. I would have the student come back after, after the antibiotic and recheck it again. And then you can compare it to what it looked like. If it looks worse, you would refer. If it looks better, then you can watch and wait and continue to monitor it. If the student develops more symptoms, a referral is in order. What do you see on this slide? And this is an eardrum, by the way. What do you think? Do you see redness? Do you see the bony prominences? Do you see a cone of light? What does the eardrum look like? Is it translucent or opaque? This is called tympanosclerosis or tympanosclerosis and it is scarring of the eardrum. So scarring occurs after the, in, the eardrum has been injured or after ear surgery. You'll often see it after tubes have been put in and removed, but this is definitely not from tubes because a scarring of the eardrum from the tube would actually be the same size as the tube. And it would be small and round and in the location where the tube was before. The reason it's white is because there's some calcium deposits, which forms the scar. Health conditions that could contribute to the development of tympanosclerosis are um, acute and chronic ear infections, glue ear. Of course, a ruptured eardrum can cause scarring. I've seen it in the nurse's office with kids who have recurrent ear infections, like one after the other, and those ears remain scarred for a long time, the eardrums will. A growth behind the eardrum called a cholesteotoma also can cause scarring of that eardrum. And basically that is skin cells that collect behind the ear and when the eardrum is sucked in, the skin cells collect on the eardrum and sometimes can form a growth or a cyst-like um, growth. Usually that requires surgery and it's very rare. I have never actually seen one of those in my students. What do you see on this slide? What does the eardrum look like? Can you see the bony prominences behind the eardrum? Can you see the cone of light? The eardrum is definitely red. It's definitely bulging. The tympanic membrane is opaque. You can't see through it. The cone of light is very tiny because the light has been deflected because of the bulging eardrum. There are no bony landmarks visible. This is a definite referral. And this eardrum is probably the type that will 
perforate if it's not treated. I once had a student come into my office and complain of ringing in the ears. And when I took the history and said, what happened? He said, well, a student hit both of my ears together at the same time. And he went like this. That caused one of the eardrums to perforate. And the student did have a perforated eardrum. So kids that fool around and think they're funny sometimes can cause injury to other kids without knowing it. So there's a lot of problems that can happen to ears and eardrums. Today, we have just put a dent in all of the things you need to know. But hopefully you've learned what a normal eardrum looks like. You've learned your landmarks and you've seen some abnormal eardrums. All I can tell you is practice, practice, practice. Look into the ears every time the opportunity presents itself. Anyone who comes into your office complaining of a cold or any type of um, stuffiness should have their ears checked. Use that opportunity to look in the ears and see what you can find. You obviously know to refer anything that doesn't look normal, especially if the student exhibits any symptoms. So I wanna thank you for coming today. I wanna to thank the following websites and people for some of the pictures that you saw today. And I thank you for your service and all you do for the students in your schools. Thank you, have a great day.